Reckless Girls by Rachel Hawkins. Audiobook. In this channel, we upload book related videos every week. If you like setting goals and achieving them, smash the like button and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on new books. Without further ado, let's jump right into the video. Prologue Salt water and blood taste the same. She never thought of that until now, until she was drowning in both. Blood gushing from the wound in her temple, the sea rushing into her mouth. Both are warm, tangy, both threaten to consume her. It's dark, but she can hear the waves lapping against the side of the boat, hear the frantic arguing somewhere above her. Moments ago, that argument mattered to her, but now she only cares about the pain in her head, the sting of the salt, the ache deep in her chest. In a way, it's easier to let go, to let it happen. Isn't that what she's been doing this whole time? Isn't that what led her here, to this lonely spot in the Pacific Ocean, woozy and drowning and alone? She breathes deeply. It hurts, water rushing in where there should be air. But after the pain, there's a kind of peace. It's over now, all of it. She slips under. She doesn't come back up. Chapter 1 Sometimes, I wonder if people on vacation think they're actually on another planet. Or maybe just another dimension? Is the only explanation I have for the that I've been seeing in the six months that I've worked at the Haleakala Resort in Maui. And I'm not just talking about the weird stuff you'd expect. Sunbird couples asking if I'm interested in joining them later that evening. The groups of women who wear coordinated tank tops emblazoned with the phrase go-getters, while they spend several thousand dollars in tequila shots and eventually get into a weepy argument at the lobby bar, or the douchey Wall Street bros who leave lines of coke on the bathroom counter and accuse a maid who serves the room of snorting them. Those are all messes I end up cleaning up, one way or another, but I'm talking about the only unhinged moments. Like the guy who offered me $200 if I ate a whole pineapple in front of him. I didn't. Or the senior citizen who spent the entirety of her week-long vacation in her suite hoarding adult movies off the TV and endless french fries from room service. Honestly, good for her. There was also time I went to clean a room where some frat guys had stayed and found concentric circles of urine all over the carpet. Someone's dad ripped out an Amex to pay for the replacement after I provided management with photographic evidence of the damage. Which brings me to today. As I stand in the middle of Makai's suite, looking at the array of sex toys laid out on the bed, considering where this particular moment falls on the spectrum of disgusting, disturbing, and deranged. This is so effed up. Maya mutters next to me, her arms still full of damp towels. It's like Stonehenge, but will dildos. I snored, already pulling up a pair of gloves. To be fair, I only see two, okay? No, three dildos. That one. I point to the hot pink disc on the right. It's a vibrator, and that purple thing is... Yeah, I don't know what that is. But anyway, good for these people. They're clearly having a lovely time here on the island. Maya shakes her head, moving back to her laundry cart. She's shorter than me and the skirt of her uniform hangs down past her knees. It should make her look dowdy or frumpy, but Maya isn't capable of that. She looks like a hot actress on some CW show who is merely deigning to play a maid. I'm not against anyone having a good time, Lux. I just sometimes think they forget that, like, people will see this. Or they wanted us to see this, I counter, pulling a plastic bag stamped with the hotel's logo off my own cart. Maybe that's part of their whole deal. Gross, she replies with a shudder, and I pick up the pink vibrator, dropping it into the bag. Prude. Weirdo, she says before disappearing into the bathroom. I grin at her, and turn back to my task. Maya is new here at Haleakala, just started last month, and while I like her a lot, I have a feeling she'll be gone within a couple of weeks. I've been here long enough to realize that the housekeeping staff tends to fall into three categories. The lifers, ladies who have been here 
10 years and will be here for another 30. So this is temporary thing, but I've been here for a year crew. And finally, girls like Maya who think working at a 5 star hotel would be fun, want to make work and will earn them a decent amount of cash. I was supposed to be in the third group, but after 6 months, I'm worried I'm sliding into the second one. I come to Hawaii for a guy. Which I realize sounds stupid, but I feel like any woman who had Nico Johansson ask her to meet him in Maui would have bought a plane ticket on the spot. And besides, it hadn't just been the guy himself. It had been what the guy was offering. A chance to travel, to sail around the world, to finally have some experiences. An adventure. Live in the dream, I mutter. Surveying the bed, unsure how to proceed. Should I lay all the toys out on the towel on the bathroom counter, the way we do makeup brushes? Suddenly, all I want to do is live. Tear off this uniform, abandon my cleaning cart, walk out of the resort, and go back home. But where even is that now? Technically, I live in a tiny ranch house in the south side of the island, a place Nico and I share with two dudes he works with at the marina, plus their girlfriends. Except we don't even have a room there. We sleep in a mattress they put out in the living room at night. The whole place constantly smells like salt and sunscreen, and the sheets always feel a little damp and gritty. The six of us share two bathrooms, with wet swimsuits dripping from the shower rod, and towels with little dots of mildew, because nothing in the place ever seems to stay dry. How was supposed to be Nico's boat? This is Sana. Even thinking about it hurts. Imagining it is... It's dry dock with a big hole in the hull. Nico had sailed her down from San Diego after we'd met and flown to meet him here. One week ticket. My entire life packed into one roller bag and a backpack. But when I got into Waliku, I learned that not only had his Zenith engine busted in the trip over, but when Nico had it moved to the marina where it could be fixed, an accident getting it off the trailer had pierced the hull. A repair Nico didn't have the funds for. Correction, Nico wouldn't ask for the funds repaired. His family has more money than God. They run this massive law firm, personal injury litigation like that, but Nico wants to make his own way in the world on his own terms. It's a really admirable quality, when it isn't also wrecking our plan and keeping me stuck here, cleaning up strangers' sex toys. Maybe the boat is cursed, I said to him just the other night, whispering against the warm, salty skin of his neck as he hauled on the mattress, rain pattering on the tin roof. Maybe it's you, he murmured back, letting a woman board the ship was thought to be bad luck back in the day. Maybe you're an a-hole, had been my reply. He only laughed and kissed me, and then our tiny, skinny mattress hadn't seemed so bad. Nico was good at that, distracting me. His unflagging optimism bringing me out of those piles of worry and doubt, and what the... Nico didn't worry about the future, and if an uncharitable voice in the back of my mind occasionally hissed that Nico didn't have to worry about that kind of... because I was always doing it for him, I ignored it, or I tried to. Anyway, before the sun in Hawaii, I'd been in California, but that had never felt like home to me. Not really. I moved there with my mom from Nebraska when I was 12, and when she died 11 years later, I just stayed in San Diego because I couldn't think of where else to go. Now at 25, all of it is starting to feel like a series of wrong turns and missed chances. Heading left when I should have gone right, zigging when I should have zacked. I strip the bath and share the sheets in the butt of my cart. I hear the door to the street open as Maya goes into the hall to get more towels or shampoo that smells like bananas and hibiscus. So, do you think I should make these a-holes of a Steve towel sculpture shaped like a cup? I call out to her. I know it's one is a normal thing, but given their tastes. Behind me, someone clears their throat, and it's draining to see two people standing in a fire, a man wearing a Hawaiian shirt and violet shades of red and green, a woman in a matching dress. They're holding my ties, their faces bright with embarrassment, or a sunburn, or both, and I offer them a weak smile. Aloha? An hour later, I was standing in the parking lot of the Haleakala in my coat of shorts and t-shirt, my uniform and name tag back in the hands of my boss, well, former boss now, Mr. Chen, and when I should be freaking the- 
I dip my face off to the sun and smile. No more sheets, no more towels, no more stray fingers, accidentally brushing mine. I've wanted to get for over a month now, but there's something freeing about having the choice taken out of my hands. It's not my fault the Sanderson's walked in when they did. Not my fault they left all that stuff in their bed in the first place. Not my fault that I don't have a job anymore. Now, I just have to tell Mika. Thank you so much for watching and listening to Reckless Girls by Rachel Hawkins. For the continuation of this book, please head on to the link below. Enjoy your book and have a nice day.